Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to another episode of Savvy Seeks. I'm your host, Dr. Savvy. You know, uh, the last few episodes that we've had, we've had some outside broadcasts, you've had some films, so it's good to be back in the studio again. And uh, this time around, I've got a very special guest, and you know how I love actually doing um, shows with... Uh, it's also great to do one-to-ones, and it's also good to meet such talented people and uh, I'm very honored today to have uh, someone who I think is a really good uh, inspirational source, but also very talented, as I just mentioned, in terms of uh, literature and uh, bringing out a lot of issues, but through her fictional writing, and you could argue based on uh, quite a lot of uh, experience as well about what's actually happening in the real world. So I'm here with Simrajit Kaur, and uh, I'd like to welcome her and uh, say thanks so much for your time today to come out from your busy schedule to talk about, uh, well, I guess what inspired you uh, about this book, uh, and let's talk about this book for a second. This book was published um, quite a few years ago. It was a limited edition run, um, and it's been hugely popular, I should say. Uh, people are always asking about, where can I get a copy? Where can I get a copy? Can I borrow your copy? So, you know, I strongly recommend that you get this out in a bigger, wider public, you know, uh, because it is definitely something that people are interested in. First of all, because it's so well written, uh, and secondly, I think because uh, it has a lot of themes in it that resonate within um, not necessarily the, the Sikh community, but also a lot of people that are uh, fighting for freedom, or just basically people in general life. You know, how if you take a look at an example uh, in the case of Hitler and the Jews, there were ordinary people that were affected by genocide. And uh, genocide does affect people, and it has a ripple effect. Uh, and uh, that's something that we need to really think about because. It isn't just something that passes over time. Uh, it kind of sits in the memory and is established as part of uh, that particular culture. Um, and uh, it's a repercussion in terms of uh, the religion as well. So let's talk about this book, uh, a couple of themes of it. First of all, tell us what actually inspired you to write Saffron Salvation uh, a few years back. Well, thank you for inviting me, Dr. Savi. Um, what inspired me was the pain that the Sikhs went through in 1984. And um, I was quite young then, um, a teenager. And basically, um, I remember just coming downstairs, my parents shouting every, to everybody in the house to watch the TV. Mm. And literally, when we rushed downstairs, we were hearing the words Bindramale, and we were hearing the Golden Temple had been attacked. And um, so, I mean, the people around me um, who were protesting, the people around me who were suffering, they are my inspiration in this story. Um, and I think a lot of Sikhs, as you say, could dwell on this consciousness and this memory. Because the one thing that fascists want to do, and it doesn't matter in any country, they want to eradicate and erase the memory of suffering. They might actually identify one particular group. Um, you know, there's, um, there's that famous film, isn't there, called, I don't know if you've seen the story of, of the film called uh, V for Vendetta. Mm, yes. and, and in the same situation, yeah. uh, they identify a particular group, uh, and then they, they target that group. And uh, V for and Vendetta is based on a cartoon, a Marvel co uh, comic, is, I yeah. think, I mm. believe. It is, yeah. But the whole thing is, it also reignites what Guy Fawkes was about, mm. the revolutionary spirit and um, brings a, a, a story back to you that really sort of haunts you about how governments and countries and states can cover up things and that, you know, what you're seeing on the media isn't necessarily true. Sure. And I think it's good that, you know, you've got media uh, groups now. You've got Sikh Channel, you've got other channels that are able to discuss the issue and bring it out uh, and raise greater awareness because especially after 25 years, uh, things can get a bit fuzzy or people can make it fuzzy because uh, it's in their interest to make it fuzzy. Um, but let's talk a little bit about the story itself as well. There's a, a couple of stories in that, isn't there? I mean, it's one story, mm. but there's, a, there's two families, isn't there? Uh, one in that, without giving too much away, because I would like you to get the book. Um, there's the, it's like those movie trailers, isn't it? You, know, yeah. you see the movie trailer, you go, why should I go and see the film? Because I've just seen the entire yeah. film in 30 seconds. Um, but in the book itself, you've got um, a, a family in the north, uh, that's in uh, Punjab, and you've also got a family in Delhi mm. as well, haven't you? I mean, Saffron Salvation, um, the actual um, sort of core of the story, one, one part of the story, um, I got inspired because I came across a leaflet um, what, when I was in Britain, and it was uh, by the Punjab Human Rights Organization. It had a very um, sort of stunning character, caricature of a, a man, 
a shadow of a man holding an AK-47, and it was entitled Why I Took to AK-47. And um, in there, I, I started to realize that there was one part of the story would come from that. Mm. Um, and the rest of the story would come from people uh, who basically were in Britain. But yes, it's basically a love story. And uh, I don't want people to sort of think it's mm. a thriller. I would like all sorts of genre of writer to come out from, and the Sikhs can do it. There's a lot of very talented Sikhs out there. Yeah. Um, whether you read um, John Grisham, or you're a, an espionage you know, yeah. type of writer, a uh, reader, you, you have the potential to write that type of story about the Sikhs as well. But this is a love story about Sharon and Jassa, about um, trying to go back and do the right thing. Um, and 1984 happens um, in this story. Let me ask you a quick question mm. and about publishers. And you said there's a bit of talent as well. Uh, what's your experience with publishers? Do you think they're interested in now, I've used this term called ethnic media, and maybe it's a little bit unfair, but interested in uh, real stories about real people. Because, you know, uh, recently there's been a lot of controversy about a YouTube video where somebody was on, and they were talking about how it was, it was a particular white individual, especially in the UK. Uh, it's m made up of lots of people, you know, a lot of people from different uh, backgrounds mm. uh, who've migrated here over the years since the 50s and 60s and 70s, and even way before that, you know, um, even if you look at Sikhs, they've been in the UK for about 150 years, you know. Um, sometimes that's hidden. It's even hidden in history when you learn it in school. They don't really talk about that stuff. Um, but do you think that publishers are more concerned with uh, those kind of romance novels and those kind of, you know, put, them on the, put, put the paperbacks up there because they're quick reads for the summer? Do you think they're not really interested in, uh, you know, true experiences, true life? Which is not irony. Because TV is crazy about reality TV, yet if you read the novels um, or even the books that are out there, Harry Potter, for example, is a hugely popular book. It's in five volumes. Um, I think it's five or six, I can't remember, actually. But, and there's loads and loads of films. It's fictional. It's um, fantasy. So do you think that publishers are into fantasy and romance and, and the real world stuff? It's just boring. Well, it's, that's a very good question, but I think I'd like to relate it more to the Sikhs because I have come across, I've tried to do workshops when I've had time over the years. And so in Canada, for instance, in England, I've tried to do workshops with creative youth um, amongst the Sikhs. So you know, creative writing type workshops, yeah. Yeah, and uh, creative writing, trying to encourage their writing skills. And the one thing is that a lot of Sikhs, I mean, we, we are uh, quite paranoid as a GOM, and we have the right to be paranoid because we had a massive state machinery operating against us mm. since the civil disobedience in the early 1980s. Um, and basically this machinery uh, and the infiltration of many, many agencies uh, and the d physical destruction of our people and the torture of our people. Yeah, and also physical construction of buildings actually, and our, uh, you know, our heritage yes, as well. Yes, like of our, our heritage, and, everything. Yeah has actually um, has dented our psyche. Mm. So I have had a lot of people say, well, um, could a Sikh story really be told? Could it be published commercially? Mm. And the, the good news is this, that um, I tried a lot of um, publishers in the early days. My, the first um, version of Saffron Salvation, my father helped get that published. Um, and um, with, uh, uh, we also owe some um, gratitude to the Spokesman magazine at that time in 1999. Mm. They took the risk, and it's always a risk with India, but they printed the book. Um, so my father, um, who did a lot of work in the 1960s uh, with human rights in this country and the turban issue, he basically helped the first issue come out. Um, and then after that, um, a second uh, a human rights group, Voices for Freedom, that were part um, uh, of an American group, they published the second edition. So various groups, small Sikh yeah. groups have It's tried. a credit to you, the fact that all these people wanted to produce it, uh, another yes, uh, issue it because, is, because they uh, felt so strongly that the message within the book yes. uh, and the fact that it raises such, like, you know, the word that you mentioned, I think it's quite interesting, the consciousness, you know, mm. it kind of, you know, the resonation that occurs when you read it and you think, actually, you know, it's so, so believable because it's for real, you know. And um, I think what's, what's interesting is that when you, there was recently a documentary about 1984, and there were a few people asked it, you know, so I think especially the presenter, you know, nice girl, and I think, I don't think even she was born, or she was very, very young when it happened. Um, 
And so what people rely on is they rely on historical records or whatever media was there, because there was a news blackout at the time as well. Mm -hmm. So there is a little bit of dilution and distortion that occurs. But by reading a novel, sometimes, you get to the heart of the matter, you know, because your own mind, at the end of the day, uh, leads you to the truth, doesn't it? Yeah, I mean, it's a very good point, um, uh, Savi, but that basically a lot of, um, there's a lot of power in fiction. Even the CEO of Microsoft, when he goes off on holiday, or the CEO of Facebook, when they're off on holiday, the first thing people do is buy a bestseller mm. or, or a book to read in the airport lounges. The unfortunate thing is that amongst Punjabi people, uh, it's like I've been knocking my head against a brick wall for 10 years since these novels came out. Because the elites and the intellectuals will say, foo-foo, it's, it's just fiction. Mm. And um, the illiterate people will say, well, whoever is going to get through a whole book? Yet, we, we love um, films, we love stories. Stories are what keep people alive. Mm. Our Sikh heritage is based on stories. And the power of fiction is that it can go into so many different psyches. It can start to tell you things and help you understand and feel things. And you can build things up from your own imagination, yeah. even with, with a book like Harry Potter uh, type of uh, book. But going back to the publishers, um, eventually, um, once I'd tried a lot of publishers, it's very, very hard out there, and it's a lot of slush piles and a lot of um, rejection later. Um, I did come across a very, very good literary agent who, who liked my work, which, which is also encouraging. Um, and she, she also said that a Sikh story like this hasn't been told. Right. Um, and unfortunately, I couldn't, despite doing two, three years of solid editing, I could not create the book she was after to mm. sell. And she, she did say that, is this for real? She couldn't believe a lot of the things right. that had happened a, to Sikhs. Actually, isn't it? So I would encourage any Sikh writer out there, anybody who's um, even, who cries when they see a film, mm. a good film, who's got emotion. The one thing that's happened in, in the last um, 26 years is a huge amount of dehumanization. Um, the Sikh people have been, become very fragmented. Um, sometimes when you talk of thousands of torture victims, people can't relate to it. Mm. When they even hear of one, they want to just switch off. But the truth so is that there are people there, aren't there? Yes. Still today, aren't there? Yes, there yeah. are. And, um, sorry, I'll come to that. Yeah. But creating a heart for that, creating emotion, it, it, it's one of the powerful things stories mm. do, which non-fiction can't. Because um, there are thousands, as you said, thousands of survivors. Um, and uh, when I got more, uh, when I moved away from fiction and started to actually meet a lot of survivors, and in the last 10 years we've been trying to do a lot of humanitarian work, um, including medical aid for these survivors, um, and we've reached thousands of people. But it, but it is it really, really sad that there are so many thousands of people. It was one of the things that you were showing me earlier on, when, before we got to the studio, we were talking about, um, some of the things that you've done, um, I mean, purely from a medical perspective, you know, people still need that help, you know, they still need um, medicines or need hospital visits because, you know, either they've been torture victims or uh, their whole family, like I mentioned this thing about the ripple effect, mm. it, you know, if something happens to a son, the ripple effect works both ways, from the core, which is the mother and the father, to the fact that it's uh, maybe the siblings or, you know, the family that were dependent on that particular person that, um, you know, was hurt. That's uh, it. I mean, um, a lot of, uh, through, uh, we've set up a charity, Gurbani Therapy, and through that project, we've been providing medical aid for seven years, very openly, to as many torture victims and victims from, and people from Shaheed families as possible. And as of the past year, we've run into real funding issues because I was really the sole donor, apart from a few family and friends. Um, and, and the books also, the revenue from the books helped pay for um, a lot of cases. But yes, I mean, for instance, one story, if I could share it with you, sure. is Marta Harbantskor. And she, um, I, I was shocked when I, I saw her in the hospital. She's an elderly lady, and um, the social worker introduced her and her daughter um, and said her daughter was a torture victim. Marta Harbantskor was a torture victim. And Martha Harbantskor, she lost 
nine members of her family. And her son was also a torture victim who wasn't there, but he's disabled. So, um, I mean, we have to honor the fact that what, what little we can do to help people, it must be done. What worries me is that there are a lot of groups out there, they show we're doing this, just like a lot of Jatabandis, uh, in order to reach people. But the danger is that the over-marketing and the action on the other side, they've, they've got to go hand in hand. Because yeah. a lot of people in 26 years, um, individuals, families have struggled to help them. Various Jatabandis have stopped, started, stopped, started. But the fact of life is this, that in comparison to their sacrifice, we as a, a Qom have done negligible you know, the, amounts. I, I would say the good thing is, look at it uh, from a positive perspective, is it's about collaboration, you know, because, um, you know, if, you, if you're trying to build a wall, you know, it's good to have a couple of uh, people that are the brickies uh, laying down the foundations for that. I'm not saying that one person can't build a wall and, and build it up and, you know, build up something really nice and well-structured, but to, to you have a kind of collaborative group, you know, like a... Uh, an affiliation of a, uh, you know, of a series of, uh, of charities that can come together and support but each Dr. other. Dr. Savi, with all due respect, yeah. that this is an idealistic I mean, point optimistic. at which we can yeah. be yeah. 26 years later. Yeah. Because what has happened is it's a disaster region. Mm. Um, I, I don't know if it's hundreds of thousands, but thousands upon thousands of Sikhs have been tortured. And the figures on how many people have been killed are yet to come out of the field. And when you've had human rights um, activists like Kara being directly killed, journalists like Billing being killed, right. who were not even part of the Sikh resistance. Um, you, and you have a country like India which up till this point will not allow formal human rights documentation and formal humanitarian work to take place on an official level, then unfortunately it is a very, very blind area. Okay. Um, but definitely, what I would say is this, that if anyone in their heart wants to help mm. these people, there's a lot you can do. You right. know, we are privileged. We have had intellectual freedom. We have our brains. We have our imagination. We have our um, freedom in this country. Sure. There is so much to do. that It's not enough just to send a £20 check yeah, exactly. to a charity this is what I said, and that, forget you know, about it for now. Having a program in days. place where you've got, it's easy for me to sit here in a chair in front of a camera and say that, you know, ultimately the people that go out there and do the work or the fact that they actually have a negotiation with, you know, four or five charities to come together, you know, united we are stronger, mm. you know, and I think united we are stronger and I think it's interesting you mentioned the thing about fragmentation uh, I think it kind of hinted to those words over the last 26 years. There is a, um, yes, there is a, a paranoia, but there's probably a little bit of fragmentation that's occurring as well. Some of it is pop, uh, possibly um, encouraged, uh, if I was really cynical. Uh, and from another perspective, I would say that some of it is maybe paranoia within paranoia. You know, like I'm doing this, and then uh, actually, how can we be sure that what you would do for me mm. will actually come out for a greater good? So there's a, another word that I guess people should use is really more about trust. You know, ultimately the people that are going to benefit are the ones who have been highlighted as really needing help. But the, uh, the other thing that's happened, Dr. Savi, is this, that when, I, and I've met a lot of victims out there, is that the human rights groups, documenters, various individuals have taken an interest, gone there, photographed, mm. perhaps written a story, come back out. But the actual level of help, I would say as a GOM, um, in comparison to their loved ones who mm. didn't think for one second about who, were they a Sikh, when they were asked the question, uh, whether it was through the end of a rifle by the police right. or the situation they were in, are they a Sikh or not, they right. didn't hesitate. Okay. We've hesitated in 26 mm. years. We've stopped and started. People have built their careers, built their mortgages. Um, and you cannot... Um, as, as a, a GOM, you either take care of your own mm. or you may as well forget calling yourself a GOM. I would right. go that far. Right. Yeah. Um, and the other problem is this, that uh, many Sikh groups are attempting to be global all the time, global and local, global and local. And, you know, it's like, uh, and they want to be the people who do it. It's a fantastic ambition. Yeah. But it's also, That's quite difficult we need to go into humility, we yeah. need to go into anonymous siva. 
we need to um, think that there are people out there who have literally spent 26 years mm. and tried to reach as many people as possible, right. uh, and as well as campaign for open openness from the Indian government. Yeah, I think so. I think that's very important. Tell me, um, let's uh, move to uh, this question about, you hinted it about there being hidden information about human rights. So do you think a novel or a documentary can bring out those kind of issues? What would a writer want to do? Say you're a budding young writer. How can they go and, isn't there a bit of a, an issue here where they can't get access to the information, yet a really good novel is something that's quite well researched as well as quite, you know, uh, from the heart. So where can they get that information from? Do they need to read a lot? Do they need to mm -hmm. have a, uh, an approach that says, let's talk to lots and lots of people and they can give us our experiences? Where does inspiration come from, you know? Do you know, that's a really good question, but I don't think that just applies to the Sikhs. It yeah. applies well, to any, non, thing, any yeah. novelist. Yeah. Um, you see people that write Downton, Ab uh, Downton Abbey or whatever. Downton it is. Abbey, yeah, they, yeah. They, they write a novel about that or they write a story about that or um, what's that other one that's called... Um, uh, the uh, Lady Detective Agency, I think it is, which is based that's in right. Africa. And that's a really lovely novel, uh, a series of books as well. But, mm. um, you know, you could argue, do they, does that person live there? Is it based on his or her experiences from the past where they bring it out and try to tie a story around it? So like, the question is, how does a budding writer, do they do, do lots of research? Do they talk to lots of people? Uh, do they have a storyline inside that says, actually, this is what I'm going to hang this entire aspect of this novel on um, and is it, is it called the McGinty or whatever it is what's the, what's the hook at the end how do they turn a hook into something that really keeps the, the writer actually interested do you know I mean what you're asking is actually another program's <laughs> worth of questions we could do it again we could do a program but, just but on if creative. I can touch upon a few of those things um, when you are when you are a writer, you, most of the time you don't know you're a writer mm. there are people who literally cannot lift pen and paper together and think, oh, I can't be bothered. And that's the frustrated writer. Um, and I would say that I went through years of that. For years, while I was working on Saffron... Is that took, like a writer's block thing? Or no, is that something it else? it took 10 years for me to write Saffron. But it wasn't because I blocked the story. It was because um, I, I kept hearing from certain people, somebody's bound to have written a book like this. Okay. You see, and so um, as a writer, you have to believe in what you want to say. And the other um, important thing is this, I was given some very good advice when I was in America by Dr. Amarjeet Singh, who, who has done a lot of political work, and he'd read my novel and really liked it. But he actually said that you must read more and make your um, non-fiction reading much, much deeper. Well, I didn't just do that, I went out into the field and actually met victims. But I would just say, as a uh, writer, that you must try to stay aware of what's going on out there. But the, the main thing is your own apathy. Uh, as an artist, you have to break this apathy. Because I've yeah. come across um, a That's young a group of artists word. just apathy a few a weeks ago. Yeah. And they were um, lovely young artists. Um, one is called Shanu. She's doing a lot of painting. And Simran uh, Gore, she's done um, a lot of um, artwork. Um, and I've come across young artists, and, uh, but the one thing you notice is when you have a discussion is that everybody talks about how they don't have time, how they can't fit it in, and no writer, it doesn't matter if you give them 24 hours, they can't fit it in either. Mm. So it's a ma matter of how do you break your own apathy. Um, and then do you wonder if you know enough about reality and does it matter? Sometimes it really doesn't matter. Chris Batty, who's the guy who wrote the book called uh, uh, No Plot, No Problem, right? Because he has basically written, a, not generated in the industry, but he's got this thing about write a novel in a month, right? Where he says, if you set yourself a thousand and a half words per day for 30 days every November, right? By the time you get to the end of the, the 30 days uh, or the 31st of November to the 30th of November, you've done 30,000 odd words, and that's probably just as much as you need for a novel. I mean, I mean your novels, I think, 300, word, uh, 300 pages. Um, but he says there's this thing called the, the inner editor, and you need to block the inner editor. Is that what you mean? In terms yes, of like, it's like an you, inner censor. It's, it's like, like I've a, written the most thing, harsh critic. I think I'll just across. rearrange that bit, because I don't like the way it sounds. And then you, uh, I mean, I've done it myself. If I've done a blog or you know, any of the writings that I'm doing, I'll read four or five pages, and I'll go, you know what, I need to take this completely apart because there's an element of perfectionism, but also there's the, the thing that, does it really sound right, you know? 
it's almost like when you read something aloud and you uh, read it you know, in your own mind, it has two, dif two different senses as well. Um, and if you're constantly reading it, you're constantly refining it. So just to pick up your points, you've got apathy on one end, you've got the in what, what he calls, Chris Batty calls, the, in the internal editor. Mm. How do you move forward? You just say, well, forget it, I just want to carry on, I want to move on, I need to keep the flow going. Yes, is it, is it I, about would, I, I would encourage any writer, uh, any artist, uh, poet, anybody, anybody who has a heart, and this, I bring, I go back to one point, flow is very, very important, but the biggest thing you get hung that, up about that, flow, that, that the Sikhs have lost... It doesn't lost. flow, I've got written five chapters, but they don't flow. It doesn't so what, do you, what, do you, what do you do in that That's case? where support yeah. groups can help, help and that's where um, the work that we're going to try and do with SeekWithin.com um, is going to help, because we want to nurture artists to come forward. Mm. Um, but the biggest thing the Sikhs have lost is a heart, um, because they have passion, but sometimes, because they come across the 50th case of a torture victim, they actually can't cry on it sometimes, because it, it's become so um, endemic, and, and it's been created by a very, very tyrannical um, state. Uh, and the one thing a novel can do, stories, films, documentaries, uh, is that they can bring to life, uh, you know, and breathe life mm. into those sacrifices, into what people were thinking, into their struggles. Um, so, for instance, I've come across a lot of people who think, well, it's too late. Why don't so I say to any novelist, why don't you start your story with, it's already too late. Mm, it's an and it's one. an interesting, when, if you picked up a novel and the first line it says was, it was, it's all t already too late. Mm. You would want to read what's going to exactly, happen what's next. Exactly, what's going to happen next, yeah. I think it's quite interesting. Uh, I, I read a, a book about uh, creative writing uh, ages back, and uh, I'm not reading all these books. Uh, but, uh, and then one of the things that they said in the book, which is quite an encouraging statement, I just kind of thought about it as you were talking just now, was this issue about characters. You know, you can give birth to this character that has its own kind of, you know, it's, it's a... You know, it's not sentient. It's, it's kind of it's got its own entity, uh, but in a way, it becomes sentient in the in the context that uh, it creates its own. I mean, Harry Potter doesn't exist as an individual. It might be based on the number of people that you know uh, J.K. Rowling probably met. You know, um, but effectively, now you see Daniel, whatever his name is. Is it? I can't remember. I, I haven't uh, followed Harry Potter. I'm afraid. <laughs> but what I mean is, you've got a real actor yeah. playing uh, a fictional character, which actually exists in people's minds. So when you are writing a novel, or whether it be about um, you know, a particular situation where someone's been tortured, or you write a novel about you know, uh, it's a love story and there, there are things that are affecting the family, those individuals in the family become living characters mm. that you can picture in your mind and you have a connection with. And if somebody does make a play about it or make a film about it, then suddenly that person becomes for real, that is walking and talking, and you know, that has another uh, dimension to it, doesn't it? Um, another perceptual uh, perspective, you know. Uh, so I, I thought that was that was interesting that you that she said in the book that she wrote, um, you can give birth to a character, uh, and it becomes your baby in effect, you know. And that's it. And so I mean, you have so many interesting characters from this period of history. You have mm. Bayam Reek Singh, uh, by uh, um, uh, Saint Janal Singh Bindramali, and Saint Janal Singh Bindramali in my. Um, uh, in the next edition of Saffron that's about to come out in about three months' time, his voice starts to appear. Because I, I, said, I read a really interesting set of writings which, uh, by Dr. Sandhu. We were discussing that at some point, his speeches. And, um, but I didn't use any of those words. Mm. But I could understand what was being said. And things like, you, um, you do not allow us to enter the Asian Olympics. That's actually what Sanjay Lao Singh said. Uh, and so once you start to create a voice around that, it, it becomes a voice of terrible apartheid right. in the 80s that the Sikhs are suffering. Mm. There are very interesting characters. He's a very, very mm. big character. But there may be other characters. There may be people around you. And this is where we can use our imagination. Um, God has given us life mm. every day until we're dead. And we can um, use the characters around us. It may be our own parents, it may be our uncles, and use their characteristics, but bring to forward um, historical characters mm. as well as characters um, amongst the thousands. Because the main thing of art in this, of this period 
should be that there are thousands of stories to tell. Yeah, absolutely. And one of the, um, a, a critic I came across at one point, I don't think he realized he was a critic. He loved the saffron, and then I showed him, unfortunately, I showed him a story I was working on um, called The Professor, and that was a big mistake. Mm. Because he read it, and he goes, but it's just like saffron. And it's just like anything, that, anything that's good, just like Harry Potter, Harry Potter 1, Harry Potter 2, Harry Potter 3 How many John are going to be quite similar. John Grisham books have got, can, similar, they've got a lawyer in it. That's quite it. A few of them and have the a lawyer stories are going to carry on. And yeah. unfortunately, I don't think he realised it, but he blocked me for many years on that yeah. story. Okay. And that story, I'm really happy to tell you, yeah. is a story that I want to bring out in the next few months. Okay. So that's your future project that you're working on. So the just professor. to get um, a quick uh, view on some of the things you're doing, you've got a new version of this book coming out in three months' time. Yes. Uh, it's going to be on and, and that was the version that the agent liked, liked. Okay. but could not. Um, and, and she is a very, very commercial lady. Right, okay. But... Um, there were certain things she wanted removed, and I couldn't okay. remove them for right. her. Well, you're passionate about it. And, and, it and, I, and she wanted the, to see another, yeah. another story somewhere else, set away sure. from 1984. Yeah. So, and that was, again, a second thing I just couldn't okay. do. Well, maybe, maybe write, make, write another ver version of this, but in another climate, maybe. In another day. Yeah. yeah. And um, So the other thing you're working on is from The Professor, which is a book. And are you ever going to bring that other... I, I only had a, one view of that book, and I either left it on the train, sorry, mm. <laughs> Or um, somebody took it off me and didn't get back to me because I had two issues of that book once and I gave it to somebody and never got it back. But the other book was called Tarun and... Oh, yes. There was a, a second novel that came out, Lucky and Amarpal. Okay. Why and not they give Tarun? Sorry. A, a, Lucky and Amarpal. Right. And Tarun's the, the name of the, char uh, the project, okay. the medical project with survivors. Right. But um, Lucky and Amarpal, um, that was a really nice love story. Right. Um, and I would like to bring it out. So yeah. for me, the biggest pr hurdle has been I haven't been able to find any seat publishers to back. Mm. Seat publishing is very, very behind in terms of anything. Yeah. So as a writer, you'll, you'll go to Are lots, they really lots behind? of... behind? You've got, you'll, you know, You'll go to various missionary groups. You'll go here, you'll go there. They'll say, yeah, what's the point? Um, and with the, uh, the actual seat publishers in India or in Britain or wherever, they're looking for you to put money in as an artist. If you spent years writing a book, where are you going to have the money yeah. to put money in? And um, it was thanks to a lot of youth groups like Boss who actually sold Saffron so that I could generate money to help the victims because that's actually what I wanted to do. Right. Um, so um, we're looking for seat publishers. Yeah, you're looking for seat, seat publishers. publishers. I mean, I think, yeah. you know, looking at um, some of the stuff that I do, you know, seat within, maybe we can give you some support in that area. Uh, that would be great. Uh, Seatwithin.com. Um, but, um, and then what I would encourage is this, Dr. Savvy, with SeekWithin.com, is that any budding artist out there, writer, anybody who thinks, oh, I've got a talented mm. relative, please come forward. We'd like to encourage your art. And um, as long as um, the subject is Sikhs and it's positive uh, in that it's not uh, negative of our religion um, in general, it may be negative of the people right. <laughs> floating around, but right. not... Uh, you know. yeah. Well, the, the truth is the truth, isn't it? You know, yeah. ultimately, what I would say is that it, it's interesting when you look at something like this, and there's a word that they use which is called repurposing or um, uh, remediation, which is um, basically you take content and you reuse it or redeploy it. Um, this is effectively content. It could become a book. It can be. It could become a play. That's kind of future stuff, right? But um, right now, there's nothing. Something it being an audio book uh, where someone can sit down and read it. And it's available as an MP3 that you could download and you could listen to it. Or it could be part of a series of, um, you know, 26 episodes and, you know, each one is a, a radio documentary. And then I think it's interesting when you look at media, whether it be audio or whether it be visual, um, you know, there's a, there's a lot of good stuff that people do and it's very difficult to put a program together, you know. But um, using imagination where mm. you've got access to audio and this book is written in English, would there be any harm if you had you know, a 15-minute reading. I mean, Radio 4 has Book at Bedtime. You know, if they had every day um, at 10 o'clock, you know, 10 pages was read, uh, that becomes part of the audio book. And if you want to buy the audio book, you can buy the audio book. Uh, could it not be an e-book? So you can download it and read it on an e-book type reader or some kind. Um, you've got the printed edition. You can have it in softback or you can have it in hardback. So many routes and access to that, but it's the opportunities that that has. And then also there's you know, ultimately, it costs money to do this stuff. You could always get, you know, up-and-coming publishers or even get it sponsored as well. Mm. Um, because the other good thing, and you mentioned it, is you've got Dylan, obviously, 
Um, that's your, is that your newsletter update, is it? Yeah, uh, basically... Um, the money goes to charity. So yeah, it goes not only are you, charity. you know, reading something and getting an insight into what the, pe the people's lives were at the time, but you're also, uh, some part of that money will go to charity as well. So I think these are great things that you're working on to be able to Thank make you. it into um, a partly, um, well, in any sense, it's selfless. Selfless in one sense that you put effort and energy into developing something that you're sharing because you believe passionately that it's important for people to know the truth. Um, and that comes across in a novel which could have a romantic background because you're trying to get people to identify with their own senses about real life stories. Because it's a real life I story. I even yeah. interrupt you, Dr. Yeah. Savvy. I just yeah. remembered somebody who paid me um, some honor. Yeah. And um, they, uh, they were actually two people. They were political prisoners. They right. still are. Right. And um, they really, really enjoyed the novel. And okay. I would encourage, do not be worried about writing love stories. Do mm. not be worried about writing about love. The Sikh the saint warrior mm. is a very epic mm. figure. Um, and I don't think people should be worried. Because if you worry, mm. no art will come about. Well, let's, let's get the, uh, the, the, the point right about the, the romance aspect of it. Okay? There's, a, there's a story about a girl that, is, that likes a guy. Okay? Um, but also... Uh, that's as far as it goes, but it's a wrap around the entire family in one sense and the ripple effect that occurs between that. Um, and love is a very powerful emotion. Yeah, the ripple effect the in the economic, the, the political died. climate, I should yeah, say. The you know. But the Sikhs who've sacrificed their lives and the Sikhs who've sacrificed years in jail, mm. yeah. like Diljit Singh Bittu, right. there are so many characters still in jail. Um, and very poor people as well who, uh, who, who stood up for what the Sikhs mm. believed in. Um, I mean, they are very epic figures. Um, in, in, in a, uh, you know, a storyline, there are also um, what might be strong to call them accidental heroes, but there are uh, bystanders. There are. They are innocent bystanders. If you look at someone uh, who, uh, and I see this clip that, uh, that is shown from the film Umu, where there's a Sikh family that sit down, um, you know, they've got a couple of young kids, and they're sitting down to have their food, um, and outside there's a lot of noise going on and suddenly someone knocks on the door and we're talking November and uh, the, the father goes outside and the mother's looking through the window and the mother goes outside and suddenly the two kids are left inside and they witness the, the, the genocide that takes place in front of them. These are innocent bystanders who, just because they were Sikh, were taken out and taken apart, you know. Um, and, and it's interesting you raise the film Amu because um, I had the privilege, uh, Beda Brata Pine, who's the producer and husband of Shonali Bose who made the film. Yeah, absolutely. Um, I had the privilege, I mean, he, he was very endearing about my novel, about my charity work, but um, I had the privilege of hearing Shonali Bose as well, and they went through enormous lengths to get that film made. Mm. So it was, was a germ of an, it was a germ of an idea. After the uh, massacre took place, she ventured out with one of her aunts who was a journalist, and then ventured into the refugee camps. And Amu is actually based on a true story of somebody. She came across uh, a woman, who would, a widow, who would eventually commit suicide. Mm. Um, and Amu was her daughter, and so she thought about her daughter later. Years later, she tried to write a novel. It didn't get very far. And then years later from the novel, she tried to write a script. And then their actual shooting of the film was literally two weeks in Delhi, and very much against the odds. Sergeant Titler sent his, you know, um, thugs in, and, and Shinoli Bose is standing there going, uh, Nebuji, this is a film about Haisab, this is a film about love, this is not a film about 1984. And literally, they blagged themselves out of the country. And I really admire a woman like Shinoli Bose, when she got an award, it was some Indian film star plus TV award mm. for best foreign film a few years back. And I don't watch Indian media. I just happen to see that award ceremony. And she gets on the stage and she doesn't, she doesn't go, oh, thank you so much and aren't I a fantastic director mm. and thanks to all my family. She starts to talk about how the Delhi widows to mm. this day have not right. got justice. And for me, that woman, um, unlike many unfortunately see characters who've got a stage or a platform right. or a TV show, Rather than bring on board other very important issues, yeah, she was selfless in talking about other people. She was selfless, and yeah, then absolutely. She, she just wanted to bring up the crux of the problem. Yeah, absolutely. And I, she said, "There's so many people to this day, and this is all in front of Bollywood, sitting there, yeah. you know, applauding her." 
yeah. making it a, But if you a look on the other song. side of the fence, you had like a few years ago when Slum, I wrote about this on my blog, we had Slumdog Millionaire, uh, which spoke about the issues. It doesn't mean that, you know, the slums have gone away in Mumbai, they're still there. And then uh, at the premiere in Mumbai, there was an interview with uh, probably someone who's quite rich who'd come to the premiere and said, you know, this film is a celebration of poverty. And I'm thinking, you cannot, you cannot celebrate poverty because it's something that you really, you know, it's kind of ab abhorrent, really. So anyway, just to say that we are coming to the end of the program. I could talk to you for hours, actually, really. Uh, there's so much to uh, talk about, there's so much to share, there's so much to encourage people to get involved in. So uh, seekwithin.com, we're going to put a page up there, so hopefully you can register your interest uh, if you'd like to know more about where you can get the novels, especially in all the different forms that they'll be coming out as an e-book, uh, as an audio book, uh, as a printed uh, issue as well. So uh, seekwithin.com. Uh, and also there will be a contribution uh, after the costs are covered that will go to charity as well to continue the, the great that work, work that you're doing with the, the project. Tell us a little bit more about the project. Yes, I'd, I'd really love for people to get involved with this project because yeah. we're, um, just as Vance said, we're the first project of its kind and it's just to give medical rehabilitation yeah. to, to victims of this period in Punjab so hopefully people can email us and we'll have a website. email address for that you just um, we're gonna put the email uh, address hopefully it's been showing through the program okay. but um, basically just in case it doesn't come up you know it, it's simajit at btinternet.com okay so simajit is spelled let's make sure that people spell it right you know it. it's on the novel as well uh, s-i-m-a-r-j-i-t at btinternet.com so s-i-m-a-r-j-i-t at btinternet.com and so then they can also call me on 07958 599378 okay, that's my personal it? number can I say that again? 07958 599378 I think okay. I remembered it okay correctly. otherwise somebody else is going to get the yeah. calls uh, and otherwise um, we will have a website for Gurbani therapy up yeah. within a month so please okay. do contact Gurbani us. therapy so those are the things to remember Simrajit at uh, btinternet.com seekwithin.com if you're interested in any of the books and also Urbani Therapy, uh, which is the charity that goes out and helps people and gives them uh, medical uh, aid as well. And I think you collaborate with other people as well, with other charities too. Well, we're, we're, um, we've provided two charities in the last two years with our lists. Mm. And what we're hoping to do is bring, um, get involved with more uh, partners. Yeah, so if more there's partners. A, there may be um, groups of families, there may be individuals. So anybody can get in touch, if, even if they just want to know where the Bravars are, okay. what their addresses are who they are, we can let them know. Absolutely. And that at their own leisure, they can get involved. Absolutely. Well, thanks so much, uh, and uh, it was great to meet you. Thank uh, you so much, uh, Dr. From uh, Stone, for your time. From an inspirational perspective, I think all those people that are out there that are budding writers that really want to uh, talk about the issues, but through fiction, and uh, there's no harm in you actually even doing a, a non-fiction piece where you can get photographs and uh, write commentary about it. You know, in this day and age where we have uh, such great technology in front of us, you know, I was thinking about it the other day, it's freezing cold outside and you switch your TV on and, you know, the satellite signal comes all the way from outer space uh, into your home uh, so that we can uh, actually be there with you. And uh, if you have an opportunity to uh, learn from that, that's great. If you have an opportunity to contribute, uh, I remember when I was at uh, business school, my um, professor always used to say to me, uh, you know, who's ever going to upload anything? You know, it's all about downloads. But now we're in a, a world where it's about content that we can make and content where we can share uh, our experiences and our stories because the truth is out there and uh, we need to be responsible to bring it out so that the whole world doesn't forget that you know who we are what we are what we do uh, and uh, the great heritage that we have as well so until next time thanks very much my guest uh, Simajit thank you so much again